So now we will go quickly through the different kinds of uh, resource management that operating systems do. Why? Because there's a, all of this stuff will be discussed in detail later. So process management, uh, managing processes uh, like uh, uh, you know, creating and deleting processes. This is something that we'll be discussing in chapter three. Suspending and resuming, same thing. Uh, uh, process synchronization will be discussed in chapter five. Uh, process communication will be discussed in chapter three. Uh, deadlock handling will be discussed in chapter seven. So we'll go through them quickly. Just we need, at this point, we need to know that these are uh, yes, activities that the operating system does. But the details will be studied later when we get there. In memory management, uh, we will be spending two weeks on memory management, trying to understand how an operating system manages memory, how it allocates memory to the to user processes, and how it manages that. And we will be uh, doing that, we'll be spending two weeks on that towards the end of the semester. Uh, storage management, uh, how the operating system manages uh, storage devices, how it manages the disk, and how it manages the disk, and how it provides the file system. The file system interface. You know what's interesting about the file? We are all familiar with the concept of a file, but the file is just an abstraction of what is stored on the storage device. So what's interesting, and we will learn the details when we get to disk management in the last two weeks of the semester. What's interesting about the file, if you have a text file with, uh, you know, with lines, uh, line one, line two, line three, it will look like a nice text file with uh, uh, some uh, you know, lines, uh, human readable lines in it. But on the device, this may not look like this. It may not be one contiguous piece of data. It could be stored on, on the device in different pieces or different blocks of data. And you know, maybe uh, one block could be uh, somewhere in the middle of this line. And the next block. Uh, in a block number two could be physically stored you know, on a totally different, in a totally different place on the same device. But to you, when you look at the file, they would look like a nice text file which is uh, contiguous and human readable and everything. Uh, different levels, there are different levels of storage in the system. Uh, you know, we looked into this last time. We have the fastest storage devices, which are the registers. We have the cache, main memory, uh, solid state disk, and magnetic disk. And they vary considerably in speed. Uh, uh, you know, for example, registers can be accessed uh, typically within a fraction of a, na a nanosecond. So when we say uh, an, a register can be accessed in a fraction of a nanosecond. Here we are implying that the processor, what are we implying about the speed of the processor, or the clock speed of the processor? So, or in other words, what clock speed corresponds to you know, one nanosecond? So one nanosecond corresponds to a clock speed of one giga. One gigahertz, so that's 10 power nine. <clears throat> so one gigahertz is uh, 10 power nine cycles in one second, which is equivalent to 10 power minus nine seconds per cycle, or one nanosecond per cycle. So if the processor does 10 power nine cycles in each second, this means that each cycle is one nanosecond. Now, uh, usually access to the register is done in one cycle. You cannot, be, you cannot access anything in less than one cycle. So this is saying that the cycle ranges from 0.25 to 0.5 uh, nanoseconds. So a 0.25 nanoseconds here corresponds to a clock speed of what? Four gigahertz, right? So one nanosecond is one gigahertz. So if each cycle is a quarter of a nanosecond, then the, the clock speed is four gigahertz. Okay, so just, uh, 
so that you have a, a feel of you know, what these numbers mean. So you can access the register in, in one cycle. You can access the cache within a couple of cycles, uh, usually uh, uh, you know, two or three cycles. But if it's L2 or L3 cache, that may take longer. So here, 25 nanoseconds. Uh, 25 nanoseconds, that's, you know, that can be, for example, 25 nanoseconds on a 4 gigahertz uh, processor, that's 100, uh, 100 cycles. And that's uh, probably an L3 cache. Uh, main memory uh, can take up to, access to main memory can take up to hundreds of cycles. Uh, solid state, tens of thousands. And a magnetic disk, millions of nanoseconds or millions of cycles. Okay. So they vary considerably in speed. It's good to have a, you know, just a feel of how fast each device is. Uh, and of course, we will, uh, when we get to uh, the disk management, we will talk more about this. Now, one thing that is interesting here is that the operating system is responsible for managing main memory and disk. And that's why in this course, we have, we've spent two weeks on memory management and two weeks on disk management. But we will not spend any time on re register management or cache management because cache management is done by the hardware and register management is done by the compiler. So I just, let me explain these. So what do we mean by cache management is done by the hardware? What do we mean by cache management? So remember that you know, 137 is a prerequisite for this course. You know, that's why we should be familiar with these uh, concepts, because we, we should have a, uh, you know, ba background, enough background in hardware to understand what the operating system does, because the operating system manages the hardware. So what do we mean by cache management? And cache management is done by the hardware. Uh, updating the cache whenever information is. Yeah, updating, yeah, updating the cache. So deciding what to put in the cache. Uh, and the main decision that, that is being made in cache management is what? Besides the architecture of the cache, uh, you know, the, uh, how much cache we have at each level, and uh, the, 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 the hardware architecture of the cache itself, there is an important, a very important decision that the hardware has to make, must make when it comes, yeah. Well, it has to prioritize what data it needs to store in the cache versus having to store it in other things. And how does it prioritize this? Does it, like, Maybe does it go through memory, through main memory and say, okay, this is higher priority piece of data, I'm gonna put it in the cache? Does it like scan main memory and choose what to put in the cache? Um, it, it might be. It might do it by knowing the frequency that it's used or knowing how recently it's been used. Does it do an analysis? Like, it doesn't sound like something that the hardware would do. You know, let, let's think more realistically. What can a hardware? What can the hardware? Do? It's not going to scan main memory and say, okay, this is a, an important piece of information. I'm going to put it in the cache. No, the hardware doesn't do this. What does the hardware do? It does this implicitly. It, it does this without actually scanning main memory. Yeah. It uses a decoder. Um. But how does caching work? You know, it has, you know, hardware cannot do sophisticated analyses of, uh, you know, the data. It's just the hardware will start with empty cache. Nothing is in the cache, right? The <coughs> cold start. Then when the, uh, when the process starts loading or accessing uh, memory locations, whenever a memory location is accessed, it's gonna, if it, it's gonna, the hardware is gonna check the cache. If it's in the cache, it would be used from the cache. If it's not in the cache, it's gonna load it from main memory into cache, right? Now, as long as there is room in the cache, there is no issue. The hardware is just gonna load it from main memory into the cache. But we have an issue when? It's full. When the cache is full. So that's when the hardware will have to make a decision. We'll have to decide what's in the cache. Now, the, the cache is full, and I need to load. So this is my cache. There is, if there is room in the cache, there is no issue. If the cache is full, 
and I'm trying to load something from main memory. Now I have to. What's the? There is only one solution, which is I have to victimize one of these blocks or lines of cache in in the cache, and I have to victimize them and override them with what I'm loading. So now I need some kind of replacement policy. So this replacement policy. So do you remember uh, one uh, good cache replacement policy? How are you? Yeah. What does that stand for? Least recently used. Yeah, least recently used. Yeah. So least recently used. So the point here, I'm just trying to, so this is review material, but the point here is that this decision is made by the hardware. The hardware decides on the replacement policy, and the operating system has nothing to do with this. You know, that's why we will not be studying cache replacement in this course. It's just something that uh, you know, the hardware controls. Now, in terms of uh, compiler control of the registers, again, it's something that we will not be studying. But I would like to explain in a couple of minutes what this means. So if you have a program that defines a thousand variables, x1, x2, all the way to x1,000. You have a thousand, or let's make it 10,000. 10,000 variables in your program. Now, uh, when the compiler translates a program written in a high-level language into machine code, machine code doesn't understand variables. The whole notion of a variable is not there on the hardware. What the hardware knows are <coughs> registers and memory locations. So any piece of data should be either in a CPU register or in memory. The hardware doesn't understand the concept of a variable. So the compiler, the compiler's job is to map these variables, these program variables, into memory locations or registers, right? And what's the preferred device here? Registers. Registers, because they are faster. So hopefully, the compiler can map all of these variables into registers. Now, it has a limited number of registers. Like, for example, 32 registers on, in hardware. So the compiler has 10,000 variables and 32 registers. So the compiler will have to find a good way of mapping these variables into registers. You know, some variables, it, it may be able to map 10,000 into 32 registers because not all variables overlap. If two variables overlap in their, uh, in, in their live ranges, then they cannot be mapped to the same register. But if they do not overlap, like you, you define a variable and you are done with it, then you start another variable. And define another variable and use it. These two variables can be placed in the same register. So solving this problem of mapping program variables into CPU registers, or as many program variables as possible into CPU registers, is the job of the compiler in what we call register allocation. Yeah. So I just spent these two minutes you know, explaining what register allocation is so that you understand what it what we mean by saying the compiler controls registers. So register allocation is not an operating system's con uh, topic. OK, so the I.O. subsystem, uh, we will be talking about I.O. and how the operating system uh, tries to overlap uh, CPU execution with uh, I.O. requests. The, the, but we will, uh, unfortunately, in, in this course, we will not get to uh, cover the internals of I.O. devices. But we will understand basically the interface of an I.O. device, or we will understand how the operating system interacts with an I.O. device. And in fact, we already have a, a, a reasonable understanding now with how an operating system interacts with an I.O. device, but we will not be studying uh, the, the I.O. subsystem it, itself. Uh, of course, for because time is limited. Uh, kernel data structures, it's very important, you know, uh, when we study operating systems, it's very important to keep in mind 
that an operating system is just a program. It's just a computer program. It's a special kind of program. It's a very important program. It's a complex program. Uh, it's a program that, uh, that controls the whole machine. But it's a program. And what is a program? A program is just a combination of algorithms and data structures that are expressed using some programming language. That's what all programs are. They are just combinations of algorithms and data structures. And the more complex a program is, the more complex will the algorithms and data structures that that program uses will be. So more complex programs use more complex algorithms and data structures. And since the operating system is a very complex program, and it does many different, many uh, different, many challenging resource management tasks, it will be using many sophisticated algorithms and data structures. So very much, uh, you know, uh, most of the data structures that you have seen in CC130 are used by the operating system. So the operating system uses uh, lists. Of course, it depends on, uh, you know, the, the, the operating system itself. I mean, there, there may be a certain uh, you know, data structure that uh, one operating system implements as a binary search tree, while another operating system implements as a hash table, for example. So different uh, operating systems vary in the way uh, they implement certain uh, functionalities or algorithms. So they use different algorithms and data structures, but typically an operating system would use most of the data structures that you have seen in the data structures course, like lists, like binary search trees, <coughs> and uh, hash tables, and such. Uh, open source operating systems, so we just need to be aware that some operating systems are open source, which means that, that we have access to the actual source code of the operating system. And you can, in theory, you can modify the operating system. Of course, you have to have the expertise to modify uh, an operating system kernel. Uh, but in theory, you can modify it and customize it and make it do what you want if it's an open source operating system. Uh, while if it's a closed source operating system, you just get the executable. Like Windows, all what you get is the operating system executable and libraries and uh, they're all execute. You, know, you get executable code whether it's uh, the executable or the binaries or the dynamic link libraries or whatever, but you get the source code. You don't get the source code.